Welcome back. It's that bitch again. Um, so I have a little story. Many years ago, uh, a friend of mine, I was helping him organize and move some stuff. And he was rooting through his books and he pulls up this book and he's like, this seems like something you'd be into. Mm, here you go. And he gave me this book, Queering Anarchism. Uh, then I lent it to someone like four years ago, traveled the whole country, uh, came back and I was like, hey, do you have my book? I, re I didn't finish fully reading it. Do you have it? Uh, and she was like, no, an asshole stole it. And I was like, God damn, that sucks. But then she bought me a new one. So now I have it. Unfortunately, it doesn't have my previous like highlights and shit, but it's a new book, so that's good. And I thought it would be a great idea to use this project to just like fully read through the book. <clears throat> it opens with like the dedication to all those struggling toward a world without bosses, borders, and boredom. Table of contents. And the preface by Martha Ecclesburg. Queering anarchism, what would that mean? Isn't anarchism enough of a boogeyman in this country that any, any effort to queer it would only make it appear even more alien and irrelevant to mainstream culture than it already is? Why do it? And why now? Because, as this anthology makes evidence in its multifaceted exploration of the many dimensions of both anarchism and queer, we have only just begun to understand the many possibilities offered by a queered anarchism both with respect to critiques of existing institutions and practices and with respect to imagining alternatives to them. It is a true pleasure to see this anthology, so long in the making, become available to the reading public. As the authors note in their introduction, there have been many books written on, an, on anarchism and many others on queer politics and theory. Interest in the activist side of anarchism in particular seems to have increased in recent years. And at least within more politically progressive communities, attention to queer activism has also grown. But this volume is, I believe, the first to bring these two traditions in both their intellectual and activist dimensions together into conversation, particularly for lay non-academic readers. The project is certainly a timely one and the outcome of the years of planning demonstrate both the wisdom of the editor's initial goals and the value of the work they stimulated. The editor's introduction sets the appropriate tone for the volume, highlighting both some of the myths about anarchism and the complexities of the term queer. I must admit that my enthusiasm for their introduction and for their work as a whole is probably connected to the fact that I share their explication of anarchism. It's destructive as well as its constructive urges its multi-dimensionality and the ways it provides a framework for addressing what recent feminist scholarship has referred to as intersectionality. Although anarchism has often been thought of as synonymous with nihilism or alternatively as an extreme version of a kind of libertarianism, a la Robert Nozick, most of the essays in this book locate themselves within the broader tradition of what has been referred to as more collectivist or communitarian anarchism, that which treats individuality and community as mutually constitutive. Rather than as in opposition to one another, that tradition, exemplified in the writings of Mikhail Bakunin, Peter Kropotkin, Gustave Laudier, Erico Malatesta, Emma Goldman, and Spanish anarchists, values freedom and equality, individuality and community, and treats freedom as a social product rather than as a value slash goal that is necessarily in tension with community. Such an approach, often difficult even to fathom within the liberal individualist culture of the US, neoliberal, is wonderfully illustrated through the unusual format slash framing of a number of the chapters, as in queering the script in the CRAC Collective's graphic presentation on sexuality or the mixing of personal and analytical materials in Sandra Jeppensen's essay on queering heterosexuality, or Farhai Rouhani's or Benjamin Shepard's essay on organizing, among others. More generally, 
This book offers us, its readers, an eclectic mix of topics, but also of genres, a mix that highlights and manifests the multiple perspectives offered by anarchist approaches, particularly when those approaches themselves are queered. The placement of somewhat more traditional academic essays, such as those, for example, by Jamie Eckhart, Jay Rogue, and Diana Becerra, or Liet Ben Mosh, Anthony Nocella, AJ Withers, alongside the contribution of the CRAC Collective, or even what we might term analytical personal testimony, offered by many of the writers, provides readers with an opportunity to queer our own expectations of what constitutes serious intellectual interventions. In the process, as both anarchism and queer theory propose, these challenges open us up to further explorations of both theory and practice. I will not attempt here to, here to explore or even point out the many theoretical and practical questions offered by the essays in this volume. The editor's introduction does a fine job of surveying the broader landscape, but I would note that one of the things I find most valuable is precisely the range of topics addressed and the author's explorations of the language necessary to communicate their views in ways that are both respectful of the complexity of the experiences discussed and at the same time committed to clarity. Queer theory in particular can often be dense and obscure, seemingly meant to be read or at least understood only by those in the academy who are willing to spend long hours reading and rereading it. But the essays in this volume communicate complexity without obfuscation, many of them drawing on real life, concrete organizing experience to elucidate the challenges to fixed categories and to binary thinking that have traditionally categorized queer theory, characterized. At the same time, they highlight the difficulties posed for an activism that attempts to move forward without reinscribing those same binaries in the name of challenging them. This dimension of both anarchist and queer politics, the anarchist insistence that means must be consistent with the ends, that the way to create a new world is to take steps to create it, to live the life we want to live, to my mind, both constitutes both its greatest contribution to the theory and practice of social change and the greatest challenge to its instantiation. It is, I think, why, as the editors note, anarchism has both destructive and creative dimensions. Ideally, the creation of the new itself destroys the old forms by making them irrelevant or passe. But of course, that is only in the ideal world, as many of the essays in this volume, and as the recent experiences of the Occupy movement attest, when the fuck did this come out? Um, the mere creating of alternatives is often treated as dangerous and or threatening by powers that be, and responded to with force and violence. Peaceful prefiguration, prefigurative politics, whether anarchist collectives in revolutionary Spain of the 1930s, the communes of the 60s in the, in the US, or the free spaces of food co-ops, book exchanges, childcare exchanges, or radical queer spaces, may well be ignored only until they start being successful at which point they confront the full force of the economic, religious, sexual, and or police powers to which they pose a challenge. How do we begin to talk about these challenges or the goals to which they aspire? If we use the language of empowerment, even in the sense of power to rather than power over, we find ourselves willy-nilly in the discourse of power and perhaps in the midst of the very binaries that we are trying to avoid or challenge how do we challenge that binary or others without reinscribing it? As Ryan Conrad put it, how do we, as radical queer and trans folks, push back against the emerging hegemony of rainbow flavored neoliberalism and the funneling of our energy into narrow campaigns that only reinforce the hierarchical system and institutions we fundamentally oppose? How do we reconcile the contradiction of our anger and fervent criticism of so-called equality when presently many of our material lives depend on accessing resources through the very subject of our critique? 
The strength of this volume is not that it provides simple solutions to these questions. If it did, we'd have a handy blueprint for revolution. Rather, the essays, each in its own way, persistently and consistently ask them and explore the answers. In the process, they queer not only anarchism, but our ways of seeing and understanding the connections and mutual reinforcements among structures of political, religious, economic, sexual, and other forms of power and hierarchy in the daily worlds we inhabit. Seriously though, when the fuck was this published? Like, Occupy really wasn't that long ago, but 2012, this is 2012. This is like over a decade old now. I mean, shit, I'm still reading essays from like late 1800s, so. Reject modernity, return to late 1800s. <laughs> Mm. That was the preface. Now we're going to get into the introduction. The purpose of this book is an introduction of sorts. An introduction in two meanings of the word. Queer politics and anarchism have not been completely disconnected on the ground, but finding texts that draw out these relations can be a difficult task. We think queer politics and anarchism have a lot to offer each other, and we're excited by some of the connections being drawn between the two, by people in their writing, organizing, struggling, and daily lives. So we want to suggest that an introduction to the overlaps between anarchist and queer politics could be useful in this juncture. We also mean introduction in a different sense of the word. That is, we'd like more of our anarchist comrades to be acquainted with queer politics, and we'd like more of our queer friends to be familiar with anarchism. Again, because we think these connections can be particularly fruitful. We hope that this collection can be an introduction in the sense of two sides meeting one another, or perhaps getting to know one another better, as we don't mean to suggest that queers and anarchists are two distinct and separate groups. They're not, I'm one. Um, nor do we really want to suggest that queers or anarchists necessarily always have a decent grasp of queer and anarchist politics, respectively. True facts. So to be clear, we're not suggesting that this idea is particularly novel. There are already many folks doing this work. If we just look at the last five years or so, from the bash back to black and pink to queers without borders, to name just a few groups, with a variety of theories, practices, and lives that have been staking out space within the larger project of queering anarchism. Indeed, people with varying levels of involvement in each of these groups and more have contributed to the collection you now hold in your hands. We put together this volume to help draw out some of the positions and debates within this overlap. And importantly, we tried to collect pieces that were not written for an academic audience. Much of the queer theoretical writing is dense and difficult. While we feel that dense and difficult texts have their place, we wanted to provide a collection for a general audience. That said, we'd like to begin the book with some short introductions of our own. Anarchism is littered with misinformation and distortions, so any text introducing materials on anarchism might include a brief explanation of where the authors are coming from. Similarly, anarchism is admittedly a diverse milieu, not a unified movement. So while the editors of this volume don't have a strict and single unity on the meanings and definitions of an anarchism, meanings and dimensions, we do hope that briefly sketching out what we mean by the term can serve as a method for making sense of the contents of this volume for readers unfamiliar with anarchism. Similarly, queer is a contested term used in a number of different ways and requires a bit of unpacking. We don't hope to resolve large debates within anarchist queer and anarchist queer spaces, communities, about these definitions, meanings, and so on, but rather, Hope to provide some insight on the pieces in this particular volume and, with any luck, provide a framework for continuing much needed discussion with this short introduction. Then it does these like, uh, like headers for sections. Anarchism. Many volumes have been written throughout history explicating anarchism, and the movement has seen many historical periods of retreat and resurgence. We're living in a resurgence of interest in anarchism and anarchist ideas right now. It's a common trope that after the Battle of Seattle in 1999, 
when a loose coalition of environmentalists, trade unionists, anarchists, feminists, and many others shut down the World Trade Organization Conference, anarchism has seen a bit of a rebirth. Often connected with the anti slash alter globalization movement, similarly, the Occupy Wall Street movement was initiated by anarchists, among others, and has had heavy anarchist involvement. And mainstream news media, in both instances, have often demonized anarchists and spread misinformation about us. This is certainly nothing new. Alexander Berkman, as far back as 1929, in his introduction to anarchism, explain, exclaimed that anarchism has many enemies. They won't tell you the truth about it. Newspapers and publication, the capitalistic press are against it. As such, he started his book with a list of what anarchism is not. Quote, it is not bombs, disorder, or chaos. It is not robbery and murder. It is not a war of each against all. It is not a return to barbarism or to the wild state of man. Anarchism is the very opposite of all that. Anarchism means that you should be free, that no one should enslave you, boss you, rob you, or impose on you. There is a rather long history of anarchism being distorted and many anarchist writers have spent considerable years trying to clear up these misconceptions. The urge to destroy. Nevertheless, Attempts to paint anarchism in purely peaceful terms miss out on its destructive impulse. By this, of course, we don't mean that anarchists revel in wanton destruction like mainstream media often depict in their caricatures of anarchists. But anarchists do hold a critique of the existing society and attempting to hide or ignore this puts unnecessary limits on anarchism. We might discuss anarchism in terms of what it seeks to destroy and negate. The anarchist analysis of our present society, for example, has always held that capitalist property relations are based on a legalized robbery of sorts. That is, we allow, and our laws defend, a system in which things like housing, food, and water, the things that everyone needs access to in order to live dignified lives of their own choosing, are privately owned and sold for profit. Similarly, we allow the means of producing these things and everything else too to be owned privately. And when most of us go to work, we make the owners of these things even wealthier through our labor. Anarchists propose to negate this legalized robbery, the system that we call capitalism. We also live in societies in which we are alienated from the means of decision-making. While we are typically rented by bosses in our working lives, we are ruled by political bosses everywhere, elsewhere. If we go against the dictates of these political bosses, we can be beaten, kidnapped, caged, or even killed by the police. The decisions that affect our lives are made by politicians that ostensibly represent us. Anarchists argue that we should negate political representation, the institute that we call the state. Anarchism also argues for alterations to ourselves. And anarchists in the past have suggested that the process of negating our institutions also involves a process of changing our daily lives and understandings of the world. Italian anarchist Errico Malatesta, for example, wrote that, quote, between man and his social environment, there is reciprocal action. Men make society what it is and society makes men what they are. And the result is therefore a kind of vicious cycle, circle. To transform society, men must be changed, and to transform men, society must be changed. This means fighting against, and in some instances, unlearning relations of domination, including, but not limited to, racism, ableism, sexism, heterosexism, and so on. Anarchists, then, argue that we negate all aspects of power over others. The system I the system I the systematization of domination we often refer to as hierarchy. So anarchists do, in fact, embody a destructive urge, an urge to end domination, to smash power over others, to destroy the means through which working people are robbed and exploited. This communicates the negative aspect of anarchism. Attempts to gloss these over, oftentimes for the purpose of populist messaging, miss out on anarchism's rich history of bravely combating systems of exploitation and relations of domination. But it is true that anarchism is not simply a negative project. project. 
In addition to what anarchists oppose, we might also look at what anarchists are for. Is also a creative urge. While it's important to acknowledge that anarchists wish to break with the existing society and contain within them a negative politics, it's also important to recognize that historically anarchists have had a generative politics. That is, within destruction is also creation. So anarchism is also a creative endeavor. That is, has been demonstrated historically through anarchist attempts to create alternative institutions. Or in the words of the IWW, build the new world in the shell of the old. Like that fucking pamphlet rant, like literally radicalized me. Shout out to the IWW. In place of a system of private property and systematized robbery, anarchists have proposed the social ownership of society, or alternatively stated, the abolition of property altogether. This might sound absurd in a society that, that treats property as sacrosanct, but anarchists put forward a specific definition of property. Ownership claims on those things that one neither occupies nor uses. Anarchists usually juxtapose this with possessions or those things that we use or the homes that we live in, i.e. no anarchist wants to take your home or guitar away. Keep your guitar, I need people to jam with. This is how bosses and landlords exploit workers by claiming to own the things they do not use or the places in which they do not live, then extracting rents and values from the people who do actually use them in place of private ownership Anarchists put forward visions of a social system in which we produce for the needs of the people instead of the profits of capitalists. Similarly, instead of a state that stands above society, directing it, anarchists typically propose federations of neighborhood assemblies, workplace associations, community councils, and the like as coordinating bodies comprised by the people. We would collectively make decisions that affect our lives rather than having those decisions made for us by politicians or left to the whims of the market. Functions of safety and collective decision-making then would be organized through networks of quote, participatory communities based on self-government through direct face-to-face -face democracy in grassroots neighborhood and community assemblies instead of representation, police prisons, in a word, bureaucracy. And in place of hierarchical social relations, anarchists propose a human community based on autonomy, solidarity, and mutual aid. Thus, the struggle against the state and capitalism must simultaneously be a struggle against white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, and all forms of oppression and exploitation. Anarchists propose a society based on a highly egalitarian ethos because no human being should be granted power and control over others. So anarchists argue it must be understood that, quote, the war against capitalism must be at the same time a war against all institutions of political power. Because exploitation has always gone hand in hand with political and social oppression. Replacing white supremacy, a world constructed for so-called able bodies, patriarchy, heteronormativity, and all relations of domination would be new sets of social relations that do not arrange groups hierarchically in terms of their access to economic, political, and cultural power. This brief introduction is only meant to provide a broad look at anarchism, and we'd suggest to anyone interested to check out the many anarchist websites, books, magazines, etc., to find out about it themselves. Some anarchists might take issue with our portrayal above. As we said, anarchism is a diverse milieu. We wanna be upfront about that so as not to portray ourselves as speaking for the milieu when we are speaking to our own interpretations of it. Queer. Queer is likewise a contested term. Historically, it was often used to describe something that seems strange or not quite right. In more contemporary times, it was slash is used as a slur against people who are perceived to be lesbian and or gay, particularly effeminate men. In contemporary usage, it is often used as a reclaimed sort of, sort of shorthand for various identities contained in the LGBT, LGBT alphabet soup, themselves contested groupings of sexual minorities with arguments over who rightfully belongs within those identity categories and who might be defined out. Indeed, part of why queer began to be used as shorthand for sexual and gender minorities of all kinds was due to how these debates over who belonged in what contexts 
and how we might think about our sexual and gendered selves in ways that weren't based on identities. This, ex this explosion in writing about theory, bodies, gender, desire, sexuality, and much more is often referred to as queer theory with a simultaneous queer politics emerging on the ground, oftentimes in similar historical moments. Group groupings such as ACT UP and Queer Nation, events such as the roving queer eruption festivals and so on often reflected radical changes in how participants thought about and the limits of identity. These were tailed by the building of queer theory, which put identity categories under a critical lens. Some of the explosion of queer theory is rooted in the work of the French intellectual Michel Foucault. Michael? Michel? How do you say his first name? I forget. Foucault. In his famous study of sexuality, Foucault found that, quote, the homosexual as an identity could be traced to the rise of sexual science in the mid 19th century. Thus, the homosexual was an invention. This didn't mean that there wasn't same sex sexual activity before the mid 19th century, but that where before we had an activity, it was transformed through complex historical processes into an identity, complete with borders, and in some cases, rigid in groups and out groups. Something a person does, as in an act, was transformed into something a person is, an identity. According to Foucault, the homosexual was created as a species of human. Our available categories of this thing we came to call sexual orientation became based on this historical process of identity creation, reducing complex desires and relations to the gender of a person and the gender of the people that they desire. This is important because identity is a basic part of how people come to understand themselves and part and parcel of how we become constituted as socially viable beings. These processes of socially constructing identities led to the complete invisibilization of some people, which was another reason for the development of queer theory and politics. Think about it. We are told that we are hetero, homo, or bi, perhaps 100% opposite gender attraction, 100% same, or a 50-50 split. This is who we are. A good solid majority of our society has internalized this coding and even made oppressive hierarchies out of it. So understanding sexuality and gender in terms of rigid, easily identifiable and heavily policed identities effectively invisibilizes and robs people who do not fit neatly into our available identity categories of a viable social existence, not just for sexuality, but also, and of course, relatedly, for gender and sex. This has meant pushing out people whose sexual desires were fluid or whose gender practices or sex didn't make discussions of sexuality coherent, given our limited ranges of choice and self-understanding. It erased people who did not experience their gender in terms of neatly constructed boxes, we needed a much more fluid, elastic, and broad category that was inclusive and queer was, in many cases, an attempt to create space and anti-identity in a sense. Relatedly, queer was a word that could be played with. That's why I started self-identifying as queer in terms of my sexuality. Cause I was like, fuck this shit. <laughs> An adjective and a verb. Queer served as a space for critiquing identity and playing with theory, bodies, power, and desire that didn't need to be reducible to easy definitions. The implications of thinking about sexuality, sex, gender, and a universe of other ideas in relation to queer theory and politics are still up for much debate. We hope this collection reflects that. Queer has also had a degree of elasticity in use as a noun, still at times, but also as an adjective and a verb. Aside from a noun, another marker of identity, queer is often used as an adjective rather than a description of who a person is. In this way, in this way it is typically used positionality, used as positionality. That is, queer can be seen as a relationship, as context-defining antagonism to the normal. Hal Perrin, perhaps, describes this best when he writes, queer is by definition whatever is at odds with the normal, the legitimate, the dominant. There is nothing in particular to which it necessarily refers. 
It is, an ident it is an identity without essence. Queer, then, demarcates not a, po not a positivity, but a positionality vis-a-vis -vis the normative. A, pos a positionality that is not restricted to lesbians and gay men, but is in fact available to anyone who is or feels marginalized because of their sexual practices. The normative expectations that exist in society create binary divisions between behaviors deemed normal and abnormal. Whatever behaviors or desires, thoughts, etc., fall into the category labeled normal are dominant, intelligible, visible, and in many cases, powerful. Other behaviors which fall into the abnormal category and become subordinate, unintelligible, invisibilized, and suppressed, repressed, and oppressed. What gets labeled normal will affect what gets labeled abnormal. If there are shifts in one sphere, sphere, the other sphere will shift with it. Queer, then, is what is at odds with the normal and lines up with the category of abnormal. Since the normal can change, so can the abnormal, the queer. This is why queer is called the positionality. What is deemed queer is not fixed. It is contextual and related to what is called normal. The reason the term queer in this sense isn't restricted to gay or lesbian is because many sexual, many sexual practices are considered abnormal. Some that aren't primarily based on gender, for instance, particular ways of having sex like BDSM or kink, or particular ways of fashioning or arranging sexual relationships like polyamory or sex work. The normal sexuality in our own society isn't just hetero. It is a particular form of heterosexuality. A heterosexuality that is a goal of, hap of a happily married couple in a permanent relationship, abiding by the plethora of norms that make up what is referred to as heteronormativity. A very specific type of heterosexuality that reinforces the dominance of the ascribed set of norms, cohabitation, procreation, marriage, monogamous coupling, etc. We might also then analyze queer sexual practices and gender embodiment that recognizes that Hierarchies exist within heterosexuality, allowing us a frame to discuss non-monogamy, polyamory, sex work, BDSM, and so on, both within same-sex relationships and elsewhere. I, I hate the term non-monogamy. Just say polyamorous. I hate definition by negation. It makes me angry. I'm smart. I have opinions that are educated. This doesn't mean that all of these sexual and gender practices are experienced the same way or oppressed to the same degree. That is context specific and also related to and also related to other identities that people might be assigned or the class position that they might inhabit. Rather, it is strategic for all people marginalized and oppressed by heteropatriarchy to organize and struggle together. And that means we need a lens through which to examine a variety of marginalized sexual and gender practices. That does not mean that heteropatriarchy treats all deviants the same. It means that there is no scarcity of liberation and that if liberation in the final instance is going to be meaningful, it must include us all. Further, along with the sexual, the socially constructed nature of sexuality and gender, as the intersex movement has taught us, we can also put sex under this critical lens. Sex is also put into a binary framework in our society. Male and female, which, fea which fails to recognize the range of hormonal, sexual, and even chromosomal makeup that people can embody, and importantly, also ignores the, co the coercive nature of the state's attempts to define our sexual selves for us at birth. This allows for more holistic politics of sex, sexuality, and gender. It also gives us theoretical space to queer our naturalized assumptions about our identities. Consider, for example, people who exist in the margins of available categories for race and how it can make their existence or identity incoherent or perhaps changing depending on the context they are in. White in some contexts, perhaps Latino in others and so on. What might politics look like if we began looking at identities in ways that do not treat them as fixed, monolithic, and eternal? A little Buddhist sentiment in there. You know, there's, no, there's no true you. There's no real self. There's no enduring soul. This antagonistic relationship with the normal 
has also led to an anti-assimilationist ethic that often sets queer politics apart from mainstream GLBT politics. So the holy trinity of mainstream gay and lesbian politics, same-sex marriage, don't ask, don't tell, and hate crimes legislation are often rejected and critiqued within queer politics. Much of this is reflected as well in queer tendencies towards a radical politics that is critical of the state. After all, the state forcibly assigns us identity categories and its enforcers mirror the ways that bodies and desires are policed to fit neatly within these categories. The state is also an enforcer of borders in much those categories. Sorry. The state is also an enforcer of borders in much the same way that our society demands strict and rigid borders around identity. Sorry, I like skipped a little bit. After all, the state forcibly assigns us identity categories and it enforce and its enforcers mirror the way that bodies and desires are policed to fit neatly within these categories. Queer people particularly suffer at the hands of the state and its prisons. Indeed, while part of this ambivalence towards the state is a common trait in queer politics, there is likewise often an ethic of working class liberation and anti-capitalism within queer communities. Linking up nicely with anarchist values, another reason that a collection such as this is long overdue. This position with regard to the normals also embedded in how queer is used as a verb, particularly in the process of queering, since queer theory and politics came primarily out of investigations into sex, sexuality, and gender, oftentimes the word is used to connote adding a needed analysis of them to an already existing theory or set of ideas. So we might start the process of queering anarchism in this way, adding a needed critical analysis of sex, sexuality, and gender, where it is often either out of date or simply missing. Likewise, it can be used as a verb to describe the process of making a given set of ideas strange, to destabilize dominant understandings and underlying assumptions. So queering anarchism might also refer to making anarchism strange, creating new understandings of anarchism that redefine it using insights from queer theory and politics. Queering anarchism. In this collection, one can find all of these uses of queer as a noun, an adjective, and a verb, rather than trying to fit all of these pieces into a single coherent definition of the word, we collected chapters knowing that they would at times be contradictory. For us, the purpose of this book was to create a collection that might move conversations forward, and that meant allowing for a huge range of approaches to queer, as well as a diversity of expressing those approaches. So the reader will also find that queer the script, so to speak, attempting to use creative means to convey ideas outside of the format of theoretical essays. This process of collection and editing took over three years, spanned changes in the editorial collective, and likewise saw some authors stick with us throughout and some lose contact with us in the long process. When we first put the idea together, we decided that like most edited collections, we would create discrete sections for the book. We sought out pieces of theory, writing on practice, and reflections on life experiences. In the end, however, we realized that nearly every chapter contained all three of these. So we tried to place them in an order that makes sense, showcases the diversity of thought in the collection, but isn't limited to discrete sections. They'd bleed, they'd bleed completely into each other if we tried anyway. We did, however, try to create an order that would draw out familiar theoretical terrain and build on that in a process that with any luck will give readers a chance to situate the contents better as they travel through these chapters. We begin with Ryan Conrad, who has done quite a lot of work in critiquing assimilationist strategies and the equality rhetoric of the mainstream gay and lesbian movement. Conrad uses his critique of these assimilationist goals to suggest that we might expect much more than equality under the existing institutions. In fact, we might create a new world. Jay Rogue spells out lessons anarchists might learn from the trans feminist movement, suggesting ways that we might update our feminism and build an anarchist gender politics that is nuanced and holistic. 
Abby Volcano pens an intervention into radical queer politics, arguing to be watchful of inverting hierarchies and basing our politics solely on simplified oppositions. Stacy, aka Sally Darity, fucking nice, <laughs> reviews existing theories of gender, drawing out a queer anarchist analysis that can serve as a framework for paths out of our current gender practices and understanding. Jamie Heckert explores ways we might queer anarchism and make it strange. In the process, he expresses a need for a creative politics not solely defined by antagonistic oppositions. Farhang Rouhani tells the story of opening a queer social center and the messiness involved in attempting to create and maintain such spaces where identity categories are simultaneously questioned, created, destabilized, and sometimes celebrated by participants. Jeremy Marie Lissigang, I'm sorry for fucking up your name if you ever see this, um, ties the struggle against the state I don't know, ties the struggle against the state together with the liberation of trans people and shows that the state is intimately involved in coercive gendering and gender assignment, suggesting that trans liberation requires the abolition of state. Next, Benjamin Shepard argues for queering anarchist organizing that might lead us, for, might lead us toward a politics of pleasure. That essay really influenced me years ago. This links up nicely with harm reduction approaches to organizing for better worlds and thinking about queering politics to provide new ways of conceiving of political interventions. Gage Aparista, Aparista? Gage argues that class struggle must be a central component of queer organizing, asserting in the process that class is not, sim not a simple identity and that we need to organize as a class against capitalism. The CRAC collectively queers the script, providing a comic that details conversations among people about how sexual and gender politics relate to their political activity and their lives as radicals and anarchists. Stephanie Grauman investigates how the economy is involved in our contemporary constructions of sexuality and gender and argues that we might queer the economy or shift our understanding of economics to recognize its place in other spheres of life particularly our gendered and sexual lives. Sandra Jepsen, Jepsen? Jepsen provides a personal narrative about how queering anarchism might happen in the lives of people who tend to have heterosexual relationships, but do not identify with straightness and heterosexuality. Finally, Susan Song writes about the intersections between polyamorous sexual practices and relations and anarchist politics. Diana C.S. Becerra writes in a media analysis of Sex in the City, paying close attention to how pop cultural forms construct our understandings of gender and sexuality. She compellingly argues that anarchists might use these kinds of analyses to pinpoint the ways that cultural influence, that culture influences our understanding of ourselves and our relationship with others. C.B. Daring argues that anarchists should have an analysis of sex work that doesn't mirror the moralism that is often connected with radical analyses of labor in the sex industry. Jason Linden ties in anarchist queer politics with a need for resisting the prison industrial complex. He puts forward an anarchist queer perspective on abolition. Liat Ben Moshi, Anthony J. Nocella, two, and AJ, or II, I'm not sure if it's two or II, um, and AJ Withers, suggests that we recognize parallels between disability and queerness, making the case that we might not just queer anarchism, but queer crip anarchism, connecting fights against heteronormativity and other forms of oppression and exclusion with struggles against ableism. Sappho Papantonopoulos contends that straightness is not an identity, but a set of social relations and for liberation to be total and consistent with anarchist principles. Those sets of social relations must be uprooted, exposed, and destroyed. Hex, Hexy playfully relates BDSM practices to anarchism, using this relationship to draw out kinky paths to queering anarchism. We think the strong connections between anarchist and queer politics are striking, but as they say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. <laughs>
We hope this collection serves as a smorgasbord of sorts providing insights into how we might alter the landscape of this often miserable, violent, and boring world and bring into being different ones. We think the case here is supported quite well, that there are many more fruitful engagements to emerge from this meeting of queer and anarchism and a variety of other partnerships along the way. Good introduction. I don't think I had read the whole introduction before. Um, so yeah, we'll read like one essay a day, some longer, some shorter. Um, keep being gay. It's the gay month. Go out and be gay in public. Fuck your partner on the street. Don't get caught. <laughs> I think it's illegal in most places. Yeah. Have, have, have a good day.